Il me fait grand plaisir de vous accueillir aujourd'hui pour la deuxième partie de l'inauguration d'une nouvelle série annuelle des, de conférences publiques, les conférences publiques Charles Taylor en pensée politique. It gives me great pleasure to welcome you to the second part of the inaugural Charles Taylor Lecture Series in Political Thought. This new lecture series is organized by the Groupe de Recherche en Philosophie Politique de Montréal, or GRIP, as we affectionately call it here, an internationally recognized research team spanning the departments of political science and philosophy at McGill University, l'Université de Montréal, l'UCAM, and Concordia University. Drawing on multiple methodological approaches and traditions of political thought in both English and French, GRIP has become a center for some of the most exciting uh, research in political theory and philosophy worldwide. GRIP comprises a team of 22 core faculty members along with two or more postdoctoral fellows per year and an annually selected graduate fellowship cohort ranging in size from 20 to 30 in recent years. The lecture series is named in honor of Montreal's own most eminent political theorist and philosopher Charles Taylor. He is the perfect emblem of the Montreal political theory community. Not only is he our city's most internationally recognized political theorist and being affiliated with two of our universities. He is also a shining symbol of our community's bilingual and pluralistic character. Professor Taylor's work span not only political philosophy but also the history of ideas, most notably in his interpretation of Hegel. He has, uh, he has contributed to analytical philosophy, phenomenology, hermeneutics, philosophy of social science, moral philosophy, philosophy of religion, and social theory. He's one of the rare intellectuals who succeeded in combining top-notch intellectual work with considerable pu public engagement. He has contributed and continues to contribute in exemplary fashion to the key debates in Quebec and Canadian society. His co-chairing of the Commis Commission Bouchard-Taylor uh, on reasonable accommodations is only one example. What better person to give the inaugural lectures established in honor of Charles Taylor than Philip Pettit? a towering figure who combines broad intellectual scope in political philosophy, ethics, philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, social philosophy, history of ideas, combines all of these with socio-political engagement as he uh, did, I think known to most of us here, with the Zapatero government in Spain. Philip Pettit, a Rockefeller University professor uh, of politics and human values at University of Princeton, where he enseigned the theory of politics and the philosophy since 2002. Since 2012, he is also a distinguished university professor of philosophy at the uh, University National Australian in uh, Canberra. In 2017, he was selected as a companion of the Order of Australia, born and having grown up in Ireland. Uh, il était lecturer à l'Université uh, College Dublin et un research fellow à Trinity Hall, Cambridge, uh, et professeur de philosophie à l'Université uh, Brantford avant de se joindre à uh, la Research School of Social Sciences, Australian National University, uh, jusqu'à 2002. Il a été nommé fellow uh, de la American Academy of Arts and Sciences en 2009 et membre honoraire de la Royal Irish Academy en 2010 et corresponding fellow de la British Academy en 2013. Il est depuis longtemps uh, fellow des Académies australiennes en sciences sociales et humaines. Before turning to the main event, I would once again like to thank our sponsors. The event is organized by GRIP, but we've had many uh, much uh, help and support from other organizations as well, including the philosophy department at the University of Montréal, the philosophy department and political science department at McGill University, le Centre de Recherche Interdisciplinaire sur la Diversité et la Démocratie, le Centre de Recherche en Éthique, le Groupe de Recherche sur les Sociétés Plurinationales, the Concordia Social Justice Network, and the Yan P. Uh, Lynn Center at McGill University. Please join me in once again welcoming Professor Philip Pettit. Well, let me say again how honored and pleased I am to be giving these lectures, deeply honored. And uh, it strikes a particular chord with me because uh, Charles Taylor, Chuck Taylor's work has meant a lot to me in my lifetime, indeed Chuck Taylor himself, 
probably more than he realizes. Uh, as I mentioned yesterday, I think when I was uh, quite young, the one person in the world I wanted to work with, and uh, I, I wrote to him at the time, but it didn't work out exactly, was indeed um, Charles Taylor. He was at that time indeed in, in Montreal. So I'd also like, just before starting, I may not get the chance again to say how grateful I am to, I won't dare try to unravel the acronym, to GRIP, <laughs> and to GRIP's spokesperson, uh, Arash, <laughs> and the many other people who've given me such great welcome um, over the last couple of days. Okay, so yesterday, uh, and these are themes that I see as very woven into the Taylor sort of Weltanschauung, because that's what it is, an overall view of the world, um, which I've tried to connect with, I felt I've connected with in some of my own work, and uh, I've picked these two themes, which are, as I said yesterday, so to speak, at foundations of political philosophy rather than center to, for example, theory of justice. Yesterday I spoke about the notion of a person, which is clearly an important concept to articulate and get clear about before developing your particular political theory. And I argued for a very social conception of the person, um, arguing in particular that this was resonant with many of the themes in uh, Chuck Taylor's work. Um, it's a conception under which um, a person is a being, uh, an agent, who has the capacity, the you know, ready to use capacity, um, to personate a word used by Thomas Hobbes, of course, where person it means present to other people a persona and invite other people to rely on that persona, where the persona is a, a picture of the overall beliefs and desires and values and attitudes that you hold. We all personate all the time, so I argued yesterday, in speaking with one another, particularly in a commissive way, that is to say in avowing, not just reporting like you might in a third person, in avowing our beliefs to one another, or in uh, avowing our desires, the things other people can rely on us to um, be faithful to in our action, and of course in avowing various other aspects of our attitudes as well, as, and in pledging what we're going to do, pledging our intentions, and I suggested that we personate in that way all the time. We do it actively, of course, when we make promises, when we say where we stand, um, but we do it all the time in a virtual way, insofar as we are aware that other people have expectations, assumptions about us, about what we believe, about what we desire, about what we can be relied upon to do. Those are manifest to us, and manifest to others that they're manifest to us, and insofar as we don't say, nay, no, 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 I'm not like that, uh, to that extent, we're also committed all the time. So living in a dense world of norms and expectations as mutual manifest expectations as we all do, we all are projecting all of the time an image, that I very much like the notion of image, a persona, this is us, we're saying to other people. Of course, we're also saying it to ourselves, because insofar as we personate, we develop a sense of who we are, so that when I say to you, this is who I am, you can rely on this, as we're a character that I'm presenting, I'm equally saying that to myself. And so, it's not just being faithful to what I've said to others, but it's being faithful to what I hold about myself, that I um, aspire to do in being a person. Of course, a person, as I said, in that sense, forgive this very brief summary, but I'm aware some people weren't there yesterday. Of course, this is so brief, maybe wholly unintelligible to those who weren't, whoever we can but try. Um, I said that a person in that sense is going to have all of the characteristics we associate with personhood, like various capacities, or going to have duties, like the duties you invite other people, you take on, assume when you invite other people to rely on you, like the rights you have when other people commit to you and uh, you are entitled, so to speak, to rely on them as they communicate with you. And equally, there's an ideal built into being a person, which is the ideal of actually forming attitudes that are reliable and living up to them. And um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that today. And finally, yesterday I emphasized that the three features of this notion of being a person 
that are deeply resonant with um, Professor Charles Taylor's work. Um, one is that it's a, um, it's a deeply social conception because you can only be a person in the company of other persons. You need someone, so to speak, um, to project to, to relate to, to invite, to rely on you in order to actually be a person and have even a sense of yourself as a person on this account. It's a language first theory, secondly in the sense that it presupposes language or at least a system of communication in a broad sense. It's only in the space and the life world, as it were, of language that we can become persons in that way or aspire to be persons. Um, and um, it's also a, uh, it's, um, it's a notion of personhood, of course, that you can fail to achieve it. Um, there was a third feature of personhood. <laughs> it's, it's escaping me that I was wanting to emphasize yesterday. It's social, language first. Who remembers the third? Ideal. Hmm? Narrativity, indeed, thank you very much. <laughs> so on his way of speaking, there's no self without a self that tells a story about itself. And I was suggesting that insofar as we commit and personate, we're not thinking about telling a story, we're not doing it narcissistic, but we are building up an image of ourselves, a persona, um, that we ourselves are able, at least in principle, to access. Okay, so today I want to talk about values. Now, one of the uh, points that uh, Professor Taylor stresses in his work is that there's a deep connection between being a person and having values. Uh, I articulate it in a slightly different way from how he does, but I think it's wholly congenial to his work. Of course, it's very striking about us as a species, about human beings, is that not only are we, it seems to me, unique in being persons in this social sense that I've tried to articulate, uh, but it's also the case that we are, it seems to me, the only creatures amongst the uh, products of natural evolution that we live around, including robots, um, who have a sense of values. Uh, what is it to have a value? Well, I think something is a value for you if it's a it's a feature or a property of actions or relations or institutions or whatever that has two characteristics. Uh, one, it's um, apt to be attractive. It's the sort of property that in general doesn't leave you cold. You know, it engages something about your sensibility. It responds to your affectivity in some respect. Nothing, something could not be a value for you unless it had that resonance with your, uh, with your sensibility, with your desires. It has to be attractive to you. It's apt to be desired. I'm going to put it that way. But not only is it apt to be desired, I mean, there are lots of properties that are apt to be desired um, that we don't regard as values. Uh, we regard a property as a value only if not only is it apt to be desired in that way, it's fit to be desired. Now, here's how I think about that, and uh, I think it's sort of an intuitive thought we all share. Um, suppose that you are facing a choice between uh, two options, going left, going right. Think of it spatially or politically or however you like. Uh, there are going to be various properties attached to each of those options. Um, some of them will be, you know, you sort of think, oh, wait a moment, I, I'd really do well in... Um, business, I'd get very rich, let's suppose if I went to the right. Um, you don't think of that as a value, but it's certainly an attractor. You know, it's, it's apt to engage your desire, that's for sure. Um, forgive me putting it in a, a presumptive way, but going left, suppose, you won't be as rich, but on the other hand, you think that you can do some good for the world in some way, let, let us suppose. Now, if you think that what this has to be said for going right is that it's attractive in the sense of it answers to your wish for money to be wealthy, and this, insofar as it answers to another attractor, which is you would like to help other people or, let's say, relieve poverty in some way in your society. Um, which of these of either is a value? Well, so far I haven't said enough to tell you which is a value for you. Um, but if, for example, relieving poverty is something that counts as a value for you, and the other is not 
counts as a value, but an attractor merely, then what's going to be true is you'll think that there's something you failed in a way if you go this way, if the attractor draws you rather than um, this attractor over here drawing you to the left. So what is a value? A value is an attractor that you regard as it's apt to engage your desire, but equally you feel that there's something you failed if you don't go along with it. Whereas you, um, if you don't go, if you go the other way, that's a sort of failure. Now, that's very abstract, but it's going to become a little more concrete, I hope. But one of the problems in explaining value really is, how is it that, you know, you think of the dog or a regular animal, you know, it clearly is conflicting desires in various cases, and we all know how our pets have conflicting desires, and you could see them go one way or the other. But we experience something that's not just a conflict of desire. Of course, we do experience that too. Uh, but we also experience a conflict where we feel there's a failure on our part if we go one way, you know, as in what we call temptation. If you give in to the temptation, you know. Maybe you're on a diet, to take a very simple example. You know, well, there you are. It's a lovely croissant. It's exactly, you know, the sort of thing gets you warmed up and so on. And you're, you're... But on the other hand, it's a value for you that you lose weight, you know. You sort of count it as a failure if you go the croissant way, you know, and not... That means that, as it were, in this case, restraining what you eat, that's a property that is not just, it does presumably have some hold on your attraction, but it's also the one that uh, makes it right to go that way in some sense, the failure to go the other way. Okay, so that's what we have to explain, how we as human beings get to be creatures who can be pulled into directions, not just by two desires, so that it's just, a, as it were, a, a um, a toss-up as to which is going to win, uh, a conflict where, in some sense, it's a failure to go one way and not a failure to go the other way. And when an attractor is such that going that way is a way of success, not a failure, we think of it as a value. Very abstract. I'm sorry about that. But it will become a little bit more, um, more concrete, I think. So let me come back to the personation theme. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to characterize what's involved in being a person in a little bit more detail on some aspects from what I did yesterday. And then I'm going to try to persuade you that a person in that sense is bound to identify certain attractors, desiderata, attractive properties, not just as attractors, but also as playing the role that makes them fit to be called values. That is to say, as attractors such that not going with them counts as a sort of failure. OK, so back to personation. If I personate successfully, if I hold out an image, a persona, a character that I identify with, inviting you to rely on my being that person, thinking myself, it's not impersonation. I see myself as that person. It's really important to me, too. Then what I'm saying is that, look, we all know that the, uh, there will be the wayward sort of uh, impulses or whatever factors that can affect our psychology, which can drag us, so to speak, in their direction so that we won't prove to be as reliable as we aspire to be. So for example, if I uh, present myself as being a true friend to somebody, then presumably I'm going to uh, think that I shouldn't speak ill of the person or tell a nasty story about the person, let's suppose, at a party where he's not present. Um, and that's going to be manifest between us that if I'm presenting as a friend to him, as I may do in all sorts of ways, maybe over a long history, that's the sort of thing he or she would not expect of me, that I would let them down in that way. But of course, equally, we know that there are many circumstances, like you're at the party, someone's telling stories, they're great yarns, you know, you haven't sort of, and various names come up, and you're really tempted to tell this yarn, because it's very funny, you know, but maybe embarrassing for your friend. And you know, there's a real sort of impulse, and these people will really enjoy you, and you've had a few drinks, you know. Well, there's a real, we know that there are factors like that in human life that would mean that if you give in to them, if you're drawn by them, you're going to uh, not be, live up to the persona that you presented. Um, you're going to fail, so to speak, in that uh, 
personation. That means that when I personate, either in terms of projecting beliefs I hold or intentions I mean to act on or desires I embrace, when I do that, I presumably have some ground for thinking that I can stick with this. You know, for example, the case of desire, stick with this attractor, you know, be faithful to it, um, robustly, so to speak, across conditions where that sort of well, disturber, we might call it, arises. You know, the temptation to tell the story against your friend. And um, how do you characterize a disturber or distractor like that? Well, I think of it in this way. You recognize in advance that, gee, I'm going to that party and they're great yarn tellers and I'm going to be really tempted to tell that story about Chuck Taylor, whom I knew years ago, you know, even though I'd be really embarrassed. But I mean, I'm going to find it really sort of difficult to resist that. Why do I think of that as a temptation or a disturber or a distractor that might put me off my stride, so to speak? Well, because I know that if I did tell the story, uh, I would afterwards not think, well, I just changed my mind. You know, I used to sort of um, uh, really want to act as a friend, and I changed my mind. I'd given up on it. I know I won't think like that about the influence of the factor. I think of it as a factor that can mean that I do not live up to what I've uh, projected. You can expect me to live up to, and I won't regard it as a change, just a change of mind. I mean, there are genuine. You can imagine if I vow in a belief, for example, I vow a belief, the example I used yesterday, that someone is trustworthy. Well, um, I know that there are some circumstances where, for example, despite holding that belief, despite presenting myself as having that belief, I may fail to act as if I thought somebody was trustworthy if it turns out I'm in company, for example, where the person isn't well regarded, and if I sort of speak up for him or her, it won't do me any good in that company. I know that's a sort of, uh, uh, that's going to count as a disturber or distractor, because I know after the event, I'm not going to say, well, I changed my mind, you know, when I didn't speak up for him or when I suggested he wasn't trustworthy, I, I'm not going to think, that's because I changed my mind. Of course, I can foresee equally I might change my mind, Jones might give me some evidence that leads me to think he's not trustworthy. I foresee that I might change his, my mind. But I also, I see that um, there are factors that might lead me not to act up to the belief, so to speak, to enact the belief, to live up to it, that I would not regard as having changed my mind. I'd regard them as having put me off my stride, so to speak, without there being that explanation that I changed my mind. Now, the fact that I, when I avow a belief or a desire and intention, when I pledge in particular what I'm going to do, the fact that I know I'm going to face a storm or potential storm of such, so to speak, wayward factors that can put me off my stride without leading me to change my mind, that would be fine. Um, the fact that I, I know that I'm going to face that sort of battery of contrary impulses or desires or attractions means that I've got to find some basis for being sure of myself, that I can actually prove, you know, that I will live up to the beliefs, the desires, the intentions, the values that I avow. Um, if I was unsure, I mean, it would be rash to avow a belief if I was unsure that I really have a solid basis for holding it, or if I'm sure of a solid basis for holding a, 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 a desire. Now, that raises a question. How do I give myself the confidence to be able to project a certain pattern of belief and desire as what you or others can rely on me to display? Where do I get the confidence to do that? Here's where I think the confidence comes from. In the case of the belief, let's say the Jones is trustworthy example, um, I can be confident enough about holding that belief and therefore confident enough to avow the belief, that is to say to communicate it without giving myself the exit of being later able to say if I don't act, act as if I had the belief, oh, I changed my mind. I can give myself that confidence by thinking about the data the evidence for Jones as being trustworthy. I think about his behavior, her behavior, over such and such a period, in such and such a circumstance, and I say, man, you know, that's really 
that person is someone you can rely on. And I know because of these data that really, uh, I really do hold this belief. Now, of course, I equally recognize that I may be led by a disturber to not live up to the belief, but I feel these data are strong enough to let me stick by the belief even in face of those distractions, let's call them. Okay, in the case of desire, how can I be sure enough that I'm going to stick with the desire that I avow? After all, I, I sign up to a desire when I avow it. You know, I speak with authority. I say, yes, that will be fun. Yes, that will be fair. Yes, that will be a great way of doing things, whatever I say. I presumably, when I avow a desire in that way, and remember, that means I can't later say, if I don't act as if I had the desire, oh, man, I, I, uh, I must have gotten myself wrong. When you avow, you foreclose that excuse, so you, um, as it were, hoist your colors to the mast, you know, you sign up, you put your money where your mouth is. Okay, so how can I be sure enough that I'm going to continue to desire in a certain pattern uh, to be able to speak for myself in that, in that way, in that expensive and therefore more credible way? Well, it seems to me the answer has to be that just as data can reinforce me and give me a ground for thinking, yes, that is what I believe, when they're strong enough. Similarly, I think I can stick by desires when I find uh, properties in what I claim to desire that I feel are going to remain attractive for me across a variety of circumstances. In fact, attractive enough to be able to keep me on that path even in face of various disturbers or distractors, factors that uh, would in that way put me off my stride. I mean, let's think, what are the disturbers, distractors I'm talking about? Well, things like uh, the temptation, you know, to make a mark in a given company by letting a friend down, the impulse you might have on various occasions, like the impulse of grabbing the croissant, I'm sorry, <laughs> grabbing the croissant and gulping it down, uh, wolfing it down, uh, the idée fix you may have. You know that this God, you know so-and-so is not a, whatever your term of abuse is, and you've convinced you're not. But some or other, you, you, it's just an idea fix. You can't get rid of it. You know, like Dan Dennett is the example of, you know, you have this idea fix that Anne Sally is a communist, you know. It's an article written in a different period, so to speak. And even though, you know, you've been through all the data, of course she's not. It's just an idea fix. You can't get rid of it. These are all examples of things that can put you off your stride. When you speak for yourself, you have to think that you can hold those distracting, disturbing, tempting factors at bay and stick with these properties that you've identified, these data in the case of belief that you've identified as a secure sort of ground for thinking that you will continue to find this course, uh, this course attractive. So example, you know, we're still in this realm of examples. Let's suppose you think that, um, you think about the friendship with various people, and um, you realize uh, this really matters to you. So when you say to someone, you can rely on me, I'm a friend, avowing, so to speak, the desire to stick with him, not to let him or her down, um, you know on the basis of how important that person's friendship is to you, the properties of the relationship and so on that matter to you, you know that it's going to continue to attract you. Now, of course, you recognize it. You might be off, knocked off your stride, you know, but you think that these properties are robustly attractive enough, you know, for you to take your stand with them and let your very reputation depend on being faithful to them. Now, of course, what I want to say at this stage is that with desiderata of that kind, um, you're going to find that they meet both the aptness and the fitness condition. So, for example, a desideratum of the kind that is powerful enough in your mind to enable you to uh, avow a certain desire, and uh, the friendship case might be one, but another case might be you're an academic, as many of us in this audience are, uh, you recognize the attractive properties of being absolutely fair-minded and you know impartial and so on in your examining and assessing or whatever it might be or your counseling uh, students 
and you avow that desire to yourself, but equally to others if it arises. But you know there are going to be cases where you know you, you, you had something against a student, you don't know what it was, and you might be tempted to, uh, you know you can succumb, but this is sort of powerful enough for you. Now, when an attractor, when you pick out an attractor, a set of attractors like that, and you make your, you speak for yourself on the basis of your belief in their robust attractiveness for you, you certainly you're treating those attractors, they are attractive, so they're apt to engage your desire. They don't leave you cold. But equally, you're treating them as now fit properties to be true to. Because if you are a personator, as we all are, a self-personator, and if personation involves this avowing of various desires and belief, well, let's stick with the desires for the moment, it means treating certain properties as robustly attractive as you have to do in order to personate sensibly, otherwise you're not going to be able to live up to your words. Uh, you're going to treat it as a failure, as a personator, as a commissive agent, if, so to speak, on any occasion, you don't go with the properties behind the avowed desire, but rather you're moved by properties of a more contingently attractive kind, you know, like the property of telling the good yarn on your friend that's contingently attractive, um, it's a disturber, so to speak, uh, you think it would be a failure. Why would it be a failure to go that way rather than sticking with um, fidelity to your friend and not telling the story, resisting the temptation? Well, because, of course, you have personate, you've self-personated, you've spoken for yourself, you relate to this person as a friend. And the property that makes that attractive to you is a property that you have privileged, so to speak. You have picked it out as a property for you that has this robust attractiveness, sufficiently robustly attractive to actually mean you're prepared to, uh, to commit to uh, the desire in question. So now, the, what I'm going to suggest to you is this. The reason why other animals don't suffer a conflict between desires and values, or don't seem to me to have a sense of values at all, it's just conflict of desire, as we, of course, can experience as well. The reason why we, on the other hand, often find conflicts, which at one level look like just a conflict of desire, so it's a toss-up as to which will win, it doesn't matter which will win, but we also have they've got a feature which is that in that conflict, it's going to count with you as a sort of failure if you go one direction rather than the other. And the attractors, so to speak, such that to go with them is success. Those are the attractors that you have selected out as where you stand, as it were. Those are the attractors that are values for you. Now, of course, many of us are conscious of various values like that and, and think about them and that's what moral thought and deliberation is about, after all. But of course, some of the values that really are values for us, we may not even be aware of their being powerful values for us. Uh, another person seeing uh, someone behavior over a lot of different circumstances may recognize that for that person, you know, integrity, or for that person, fidelity to their friends, or for that person, exactitude about discharging, you know, academic duties, or for that friend, you know, um, the importance of, of uh, committing in political life and making efforts with NGOs or whatever, you might see that for that person, there are attractors that are really attractors on the basis of which um, the person commits to various patterns of action. Now, of course, the commitment may not be explicit. It may be just that that person be knows it's a matter of manifest mutual expectation that they're going to be, uh, behave in a certain way. They acquiesce in that. They don't demur. And you can see that they're that sort of person because those properties, those attractors, those desiderata are actually functioning for them as important values. So I hope the idea is sort of, I, I feel I'm not getting, uh, getting it out as well as I would have wished to do, but um, if we are personating agents that hold out an image, a persona of ourselves. We have to identify for ourselves, 
at least after playing a role in our psychology, properties um, that we robustly desire, that are robustly attractive for us. And when we say, this is who I am, implicitly or explicitly, in any of a range of areas, we always do that on the basis of a conscious or unconscious sensitivity to those attractors that we regard as, that we treat as robustly attractive. And it is going to be a failure for us to, as it were, let down the persona that we have projected and go with the disturbing or distracting factors. That's going to be a failure. And that introduces the notion of value into our lives. So another way of putting it is this. Think of the conflict in question when you get a conflict of values as a conflict between an experienced desire, like you're really attracted to have that drink, even though you've sworn enough alcohol for the month or whatever, you're really attracted to have the cross on, you're really attracted to tell the story, you're really attracted to give this student a bad mahok or something, or you, know, you feel you worry at least about how you're responding to the uh, student's work. But on the other hand, you have an avowed desire, implicitly or explicitly avowed desire, a desire tied up with who you present yourself as being and who you take yourself to be. Now, in that conflict between an experienced desire and an avowed desire that isn't experienced with the same intensity at that very moment, that's exactly a conflict of value or between value and desire. And in a case like that, a desire and the avowed desire and the experiences are clearly in conflict. But if you are a commissive agent tied to presenting yourself in the way being a person involves, then you're bound to see it as a failure to go the, um, let's say the the um, to go with the disturber, as I'm calling it, the impulse, the ide fix, the compulsion, the um, you know bout of a crazy or whatever. And it's going to be success to go with the desire that you have um, established in your own psychology as a stable point of reference. Now, having introduced the abstract notion of value in that way, it's worth noting immediately there are many different kinds of value. And um, one of the things Chuck Taylor is known for is for emphasis on the plurality of values. On this story, notice, we hold desires in many different contexts. We hold desires for ourselves as an individual person over life. We have a desire as a member of a family. We have a desire as a member of a particular group for things. We have a desire, so to speak, as someone who wants to be able to justify themselves to others, which you might think of as a moral desire, whatever, a desire to, to be moral. We have a desire maybe occasionally, as it were, in loco dei, in the, you know, the Sidgwickian sort of view we want uh, the impersonal good for the world. But where desires are tied to context in that way. Now, in any one of these contexts, we're liable. In fact, we're inevitably going to personate, going to have lift from, so to speak, the, the to and fro of desire, an image uh, as self we think we are, that we hold out to others and to ourselves. And in each of these areas, we're going to have identified for us, we're going to identify properties that are both attractive, but not just attractive. They're the sort of attractive properties such that not to be moved by them suitably is going to count with us as a sort of failure, because it's going to involve a, a departure from the pattern that we have held out as the pattern we identify with, that we uh, personate with. Notice many of these values, so in, in all our lives, I think this is true value, we have aesthetic values, we have prudential values, we have things we value for our family, for our children, for our group, for our country, for our province, and we have values that we think of as moral values, of course, how exactly, which values are moral values, that's a theoretically open option, so to speak. Um, but we live in this, you know, plural, multi-dimensional space of attractors that have been identified for us in how our psychology works, and often consciously, but sometimes unconsciously, as the properties that count with us as persons that are tied up with the persona that we project. Okay, this is to, if this is correct, then there really is that deep connection I mentioned uh, that Taylor stresses between being a person and 
values being important in your life. Uh, Asians don't need values. They need desires, they need beliefs, they act to fulfill the desires according to their beliefs. Um, but a personal agent, someone like us who is a person, we're more than just agents because we are tied to this projection of ourselves to others because we're social beings. And in far, so far as that's true, certain things have to emerge in our lives as things that we and others certainly will see as values for us. Okay, but not only is that true, and I, I sort of find that an exciting thought, you know, it gives, because after all, the many theories, of course, as to where values come from in human life, as to where we get to think in terms of the ought rather than the is, in terms of the evaluative rather than the is, in terms of the normative, you know, rather than the descriptive. Well, I think one plausible explanation, it just goes back to the fact that we are persons, and as persons, we are self-personators, and as self-personators, we have to find solid grounds on the basis of which to personate, inviting others to rely on us, and thereby we have to filter out. We have to, those properties that will count for us as values in these different contexts. But anyhow, not only is that true, I want to say, what's also true is there are some specific values that you can't but treat as a value if you are a person. They are constitutive of being a person. See, what I've said so far is to be a person, some properties have to emerge in your life or your consciousness, your psychology as values for you. I'm not saying in order to be a person, there are some values that are actually constitutively tied to being a person. The first of these that I'm going to talk about is what is normally called the personal value of autonomy. So if I'm going to be a person, it has to be the case, this is now familiar, that I hold out a picture of how I'm going to behave, I identify with it, I others to rely on it, and so on. And that means, of course, that it's going to be an ideal for me that I'm pretty good at identifying both the beliefs and the desires that are actually um, coherent with one another and that are ones that I find robustly persuasive in the case of beliefs, robustly attractive in the case of desires. I'm going to find data and desiderata I feel I can rely on. And then it's going to be important equally that I live up to those. I won't really be a successful person unless I achieve that dual success, you might call it, on the one hand of knowing where I stand. I mean, you know the sort of image of the person in literature, you know, who will promise anything, who will avow almost any desire, any belief, if it goes down well in the local company, but who does it in a, a wholly, so to speak, um, arbitrary way so that you can't take him or her at their word. You've got to be able to identify where you feel you can robustly rely on data or desiderata and where you can robustly profess the corresponding beliefs or desires. And that's a, that's a virtue in itself um, and a value in itself. But equally, you've got to be able to live up to them, live up to the desires and the beliefs that you avow or you pledge in the case of intentions. And that value is just what I think of as autonomy. Now, why? Actually, the word I prefer, and Michael Smith and I have used this in, in joint publications, um, is orthonomy. That's O-R-T-H-O rather than A-U-T-O. Because notice the value I'm talking about can be well represented as being autonomy, of course, in the Greek means the rule of the self. The autos is the nomos, the law. Orthonomy means the rule of the right, or T-H-O-S, as in orthodoxy, meaning the rule of value. The reason I call the value orthonomy is that in, um, in, uh, in impersonating the way I've described, you identify properties which you think are really robustly attractive. Maybe generally, if you're talking about a context where you think you're in the same position as others, maybe personally, when you're talking about maybe aesthetic values or prudential values or whatever, but you are thinking of them as the sorts of properties 
that have a hold on you, that are robustly attractive enough. In that sense, they're the right properties to go with, right? The answer to your sensibility, the answer to your capacity to live up to them. So it, in forming attitudes and then living up to them, what you're really doing is you're responsive to the, what you see as the ortos are the right for you, and to be autonomous is precisely to be faithful to what you identify in that sense as the orthos are the right for you. And the value is well described as autonomy, being true to, so to speak, what you identify as valuable. However, there's a very deep connection with autonomy, meaning the rule of the self. Because after all, when you personate, you're holding out a self. This is who I am, you're saying implicitly. It's the sort of self that, as I mentioned yesterday, you can think of Polonius as having in mind when, silly though he may have been, I think it's a deep thought when he says this above all to thine own self. Be true. Who which is the self to which you're supposed to be true? Well, I would say plausibly, it's the self that you speak for, that you hold out, the self that you personate, as it were, when you say, this is who I am. So if the orthos is going to rule, if the values you identify, the data you um, identify as robustly persuasive or attractive in the case of values, if they are the right, then going with them is exactly going with the self, the self, the persona that you identify with. So orthonomy and autonomy really are names for one and the same thing, as, as you might put it. Okay, so I think that the value of autonomy, our orthonomy, whatever you wish to call it, that that's constitutive of being a person. Any agent who is a person and understands what it is to be a person, autonomy is bound to be a value for them. It's the value of being able to live up to the persona that you implicitly, actively, necessarily project. But there's a second value, which is equally, I think, constitutive of, um, of personhood, and that we are bound, as persons, to treat as a value. And I'm going to describe that as the value, of the social value, if you like, versus the personal value of autonomy, the social value of respect. So let me, um, let me just go back a little bit. If uh, I'm going to enjoy the capacity to become a person, in fact, this came up in some discussion after the talk yesterday, if I'm going to enjoy um, the exercise, my capacity as a person, there have to be other people to whom I relate, um, who are willing, so to speak, to take me at my word, willing to give me their words, and willing each of us, so to speak, to relate to one another on the basis of our conversable, commissive capacities. Uh, we use words or other signs with one another. We identify certain forms of communication as commissive, as in, you know, we make it expensive to communicate what our beliefs are when we avow them, what our intentions are when we pledge them, or what our desires are, of course, when we avow them too. We make that expensive. There have to be other people, so to speak, who are willing, for whom that's a relevant factor in relating back to us. And of course, it's only going to be a relevant factor for them if they, in turn, you know, either agree, you know, so we've now got a common belief, or at least accept what we are going to do and adjust their behavior on that basis and let us know what they're going to do by. Um, by avowing a corresponding desire, maybe a desire that will put us in cooperation with one another in various ways. In order to have someone perform as a person, there have to be other persons around. But not only that, these persons have to relate to one another in, well, I'm going to call it an addressive way. Again, I think that word appears in Chuck Taylor's work at various points. By an addressive way, I mean that they they give one another an account of who they are in the mode of the commissive vote of a vowel or commitment, explicit or implicit. Um, and they are prepared to, as it were, restrict their mutual influence to that sort of exchange. And of course, they give one another their word, the exchange words in that way, on a take it or leave it basis. Neither is forcing the other, you know, to 
believe what they're saying or to accept what they desire they're avowing, each is leaving it up to the other to, here I am, you know, um, take me as I say I am, and each says that to the other. That's an addressive mode of relating to one another. Address in that sense, it seems to me, it rules out two other sorts of interaction. To, to, um, to, 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 one thing you might do, and this is points to one alternative interaction, you might abandon address in favor of sheer force, for example, just violence, you know, as I, yeah, or, or by threatening force in order to influence the other person or by just you know, letting it, the other person know just how strong you are, maybe not actually making a threat. I mean, that obviously is going to be a case of abandoning address in favor of you know, a, another sort of, of uh, interaction between those people, another form of influence. So if you're going to live in a space of mutual address with other people, it has to be the case that those people don't abandon address in favor of violence or force or whatever. It also has to be the case that they don't abuse address. And the way in which you can abuse address as distinct from abandoning it is when you, as it were, pretend to be addressive, but actually you're not. Or at least you contaminate, so to speak, the addressive mode. So for example, when you deceive the other person, or when you manipulate them, you know, by slate of word, as you might say, um, however that's done, these are all ways in which you will abuse address. So you have to, in order to perform properly as a person, in order for two people to perform with, as persons properly in relation to one another, they have to do it in a co-addressive way. Not abandoning address and not abusing address. Not going the way of violence or not going broadly the way of deception. But not only that, they have to well, I should say, though, before I go on, it's not that, so to speak, in order to be a person with other persons, you've got to do nothing except talk to one another, you know, as in give one another an account of yourself. Um, clearly, we do all sorts of things, apart from explicitly addressing one another, that are perfectly friendly, so to speak, to address. Like you go for a walk together, you go to a football match together, you go to a concert together. You just uh, hang out, so to speak. You mess around together or whatever. These are modes of interaction that are, I call them pro-addressive, because there's nothing inconsistent between behaving towards another person in that way, hanging out with them, you know, and the addressive point of view. You're not abandoning address in doing that. You're not abusing address in doing that. You're complementing address in doing that. And of course, many of our interactions are, in, are of that pro-addressive, but not explicitly addressive kind. Now, of course, in order to perform as persons, it's going to be sufficient that we live in a world where others relate to us pro-addressively. What I mean by that, that includes they address one another when appropriate, but equally the other activities or interactions they perform are at least friendly to address in that sense. They're not like violence and not like deception. But even that isn't really enough in order to perform properly as a person. Because, of course, it might be that in dealing here, say, with Daniel over a period, you know, I know, not at all like that, but let's suppose I know of him, or let him be a Daniel Starr, another person, that he's subject to the eruption of anger, you know, or subject to, you know, when his ego is is uh, scratched in an unpleasant way. He just hits back at you, you know. Uh, or he just gets moody and, uh, and is going to sulk away and you don't know where you stand with him. Now, of course, in order to really live with others in the personal way and have the chance of developing as a person, um, it's got to be the case that you enjoy pro-addressive relations with them robustly not just opportunistically, not just when it suits the other person, so to speak, but that you can rely on these sorts of relations that other people will have with you, of being robustly pro-addressive, robustly disposed to either address you or to hang out with you or whatever, but certainly robustly disposed not to abandon address or abuse address, robustly disposed not to 
interfere with you violently and not to deceive or manipulate you or whatever. It's only when you've got that robust sort of relationship with others, and of course where it's manifestly robust, uh, that you really get people having the chance to perform as persons and come to fruition, as it were, as persons. Now, I think that the idea of being robustly pro-aggressive in dealing with other people, robustly setting aside the abandoning or the abuse of address, I think that's what it is to respect other people. Um, you respect them when, you know, it just, it's a matter of um, fact that you are robustly disposed to treat them in that way. That's what the notion of respect, I think, is best taken to identify with. And if that's right, then what I've been saying is that the space in which persons really, the only space in which they can develop, the space in which they thrive, is a space of robust pro-addressive pro relationships with others. And that's to say, it's a space of mutual respect. I mean, if you, now of course, most of human beings through most of history, I guess, at least since the agricultural revolution, if we're to believe the historians, have probably lived in circumstances where they don't always enjoy robustly pro-addressive relations with others. But hopefully, for most people in most circumstances in history or currently, there'll be some people with whom they have pro-addressive relations. It may be their peers, it may be their family, it may be their in-group or whatever. And of course that's going to be enough, that there is some space of respect, mutual respect, for people to be able to perform as persons and to develop their capacities as persons. Of course the ideal is going to be if respect is throughout a society, um, and that's going to you know, give you a a much firmer basis you know, for, uh, for personhood, for what personhood requires. But at least in every society, one hopes that the, everyone can find some smaller company or a number of smaller groups and contexts where they can enjoy that robustly pro-addressive pro pro behavior. So I say that respect is equally a value that's constitutive of personhood in whatever to whatever extent it's enjoyed. There has to be a community of respect for people to come fully uh, to the ideal of being persons. It's just tied up with being a person. I put the final section in angle brackets, but I'll just say a little bit, if I may, on a political value that I think is equally tied up with being a person. I talked about the personal value of autonomy or autonomy. You can't help but value that if um, you're a person. And the social value of respect, you can't help but treat it as a value. You may not be conscious of it, of course, but you can't help but treat it as a value that you should have those relations with others, relations that allow you personally to become a person. I want to say, arguably, that in politics, it's equally constitutively tied up with a certain, um, with a certain ideal of freedom. So let me put this as briefly as I can. Think of, going back to Hegel, Think of the tale of the master and the slave. Uh, the master really wants to, you know, have a, an aggressive relationship with his slave. You know, he wants to really talk man to man, as it were, or man to woman, or woman to woman, or woman to man, whatever it might be. He wants to talk in that person-to-person -person way. But of course, it's sort of destined to fail. I mean, on the one hand, uh, because the slave may just realize, you know, at any moment he can just, you know, push me around, kill me, whatever, he doesn't like me, push me aside. So you've got to be careful about your words, what you say. You've got to keep the other person sweet. You've got to try to ingratiate yourself. And even if, this, if the slave is forthright enough to actually not be bothered by that, it's not going to be manifest between the two that he's definitely that courageous or forthright. So it's going to on the slave side, undermine, so to speak, the relationship of mutual respect, of address, and therefore of robust respect. It's going to be very difficult. Will Robert said, pointed out yesterday that there's another failure on the side of the master, which is 
the master, you know, it's always just so long as he retains, let him be a he, he is in Hegel, <laughs> so long as he retains the patience, so to speak, to treat this person as if they were addressive. But actually, the benefits of address are not so clear to the master. After all, he can just push this person around at, at any point. So it's going to be very unstable. Okay. Now, what does that tell us? It tells us that if you're going to have a society where people can enjoy the respect needed for performing well as a person in just about any context, not just in the coterie of their family or their friends, then it has to be the case in that society that those sorts of asymmetries of power represented by the, ma the, the master and the slave, asymmetries of power that mean that there's bound to be inhibition or intimidation going on on one or the other side, uh, they have to be neutralized. Now, what would it be to neutralize them? Well, of course, you'll never neutralize them completely, but the idea in the Republican tradition of freedom, with which I strongly identify, is that in order to be free, it's got to be the case that you, like other people in your society, have a certain range of activity where you're protected by the law and where you're empowered by the law or by your society to act according to your will. Now, that sort of structure, which will require a protective, empowering law, but also laws governing everything from workplaces to family environments to public spaces, uh, when you've got a law that really secures people against that sort of um, interference in the range of the basic liberties they're supposed to enjoy equally with others, the master-slave relationship is going to be pushed to the edge. It's just not going to be able to exist. People in that society, it's an ideal, of course, are going to be able to look one another in the eye without reason for fear or deference, as I think of it. Now, that ideal of a free society is precisely a society in which respect can prosper. And as a result of respect prospering, now in one context, now in another, in a whole variety of contexts, the possibility for persons to achieve their best as persons, uh, that is secured as a possibility. So again, I say that starting with the notion of a person and the notion of respect that that requires, you quickly are directed to a political notion of freedom as part of the infrastructure constitutively required for personhood and for respect. If I could just interrupt myself for a moment, I have a very strong memory of talking to Chuck Taylor, he's probably going to forget this, in Haworth in Yorkshire, when you came and gave a talk to the department I then chaired in the University of Bradford, and we went to see the uh, the village of Haworth, where the Brontes grew up. And I remember talking incessantly with you, I probably was driving you daft, um, and, and asking, what should I read? And, and you used the word Republican, I remember. And I said, well, what should I read on that, apart from what I've read? And you said, and this is before I became a, a self-described Republican, uh, you said, you should read Cato's Letters, an 18th century tract of radical Republicans in Britain. It's since become a text that's really important in my own uh, thinking, but I just couldn't help but recall that mo moment. I don't know whether Chuck recalls it himself. Anyhow, the notion of that sort of notion of political freedom as between citizens, you can see how that's tied up with the notion of personhood and respect. But equally, of course, if that law, that's what I think of as horizontal freedom, you know, when you can look others in the eye without reason for fear or deference because of the security given you by the law and by the norms of society and by the structures of society. But of course, that's not going to be very worth very much if in the vertical dimension, the source of law is, let's suppose, a benevolent despot, you know, who happened to think it'd be great to give people this, you know, but who might change his or her mind tomorrow. And of course, Republicans have always been against the benevolent despotism. And so you equally require for political freedom, you require horizontal freedom. You want people to relate to the government that's the source of their laws in a certain sort of way, a way such that uh, they are not dominated as by a dominus. Um, the government is not that sort of arbitrary 
are discretionary power in their lives. Government is um, contained and channeled and directed by uh, the people operating via elections, of course, but equally via contestatory pressures on government and via the arrangements like rule of law, constitutional rights, and so on, that make sure that government performs not in a discretionary, arbitrary way, but in a way that is answerable to us, the citizens, and answerable equally to all of us. Of course, that's a very brief sketch. But all I want to point out is that there is an obvious connection between starting with the conception of person that I've been trying to defend and these constitutive values. It enables you to see why certain attractors count as values for us in different dimensions, but equally it enables you to see why for every person it ought to be qua person a value that they have personal autonomy, that they enjoy social respect in their relations with other people, and I would say that they enjoy political freedom in the sense in which that is required for making respect, the possibility of respect, really secure and likely. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Pettit, for this uh, wonderful lecture, the second of, of two. And uh, we have now time for uh, opening it up to questions. So I will start taking a cue. Or actually, since we have a mic in the middle, I think probably the best, uh, best method is just for you to go to the mic and, uh, and ask your questions. Uh, I'm next to the mic, so I'll just uh, jump the cue. Um, <laughs> I was just wondering about a case where suppose, little sci-fi, suppose some kind of swamp man-like character emerges onto the earth uh, with cognitive capacities in place and so forth, but having not yet made any commitments. Uh, so swamp man looks before him and sees uh, on the one hand a tasty cupcake and on the other hand a, a child suffering or something like that. Um, and uh, swamp man is effectively much as most of us are in Swamp Man, you know, sees, oh, wow, child suffering, that's really bad, cupcake really good, you know, uh, but the cupcake's sinking in quicksand or something like that because it's a swamp, so <laughs> there's only time to go for one or the other. Um, and it seems that in such a case, Swamp Man is already confronted with a, a genuine conflict between um, a real value and a mere desire. Uh, but I'm wondering how you accommodate that, because having not yet made any commitments, Swamp Man, it should just be, yeah, I want this, I want that, I haven't said anything yet, I'm not on the record. It's, uh, it's, it's a toss up. Uh, so yeah, I'm wondering. Okay, so my, my response is this. I think, that, um, I think that Swamp Man is not a person. Uh, I think that you become a person only in virtue of uh, relating to others, learning what it is to communicate, learning what it is to commit, learning uh, as were what a commitment entails in terms of being expected to live up to it. I think it's only at that point. I said that the capacity to personate is what makes someone a person, but I did say it was the exercise dependent capacity to personate. You know, the example of playing the piano. Can you play the piano? I've don't know, I've never tried, is not a serious sense of capacity. Um, to have the capacity of the piano, you've got to have played it, you know, that's got, similarly to be a person, you've got to have personated, I would say. And in that sense, it's an exercise dependent capacity. Swamp Man doesn't have that capacity. I would say that you've described the options for Swamp Man in your language as bad to take the cupcake, good to help the child. But I see no grounds for thinking that Swamp Man would conceptualize the options in that way, would conceptualize one option as answering to a value and the other as representing just a, a disturbing attractor, so to speak, that might take him off his, or, well, it's Swamp Man, his stride. Um, so that's in brief my, my response. Um, 
I should keep my responses brief since uh, uh, going on yesterday's experience, there are going to be lots of issues, but I hope that at least makes sense of what I want to say, whether it makes it uh, compelling is another question. <laughs> uh, thank you for the talk, very engaging. Uh, so in your discussion about desire, you talk a lot about attraction and attraction makers. And I was wondering if there's room in your theory, if you've given thought to aversion, uh, and if it would play a unique role uh, that would be distinct from just the opposite of attraction or uh, being attracted to something contrary. The answer quickly is yes. Uh, I mean, I think that as attraction can, and as where we go with attractions, we identify things that are values for us. We may equally identify things that are disvalues for us, as in, I am prepared to vow that I would never be cruel to a child. I mean, that is identifying a disvalue, so to speak, the cruelty as something you are robustly going to avoid instantiating, at least other things being equal. So the answer to that is, is, is yes. There's one complication, though, that I think I can't resist in a way. I should resist, but I'm not. I'm giving into the, <laughs> the, the interpretation myself, uh, which is to say I, th I think there is an important um, asymmetry between good and evil um, in the following sense. Um, in order to be, to be good, Actually, this isn't altogether related to your question, but let me say it quickly anyhow. In order to, uh, for example, be an honest person, in order to be a reliable person, in order to be trustworthy, you take it, in order to be a good friend, it's required that you do something, not just contingently, but robustly. In order to be honest, you've got to tell the truth robustly. In order to be respectful, you've got to restrain yourself robustly in dealing with other people in various ways. In order to be trustworthy, you've got to be robustly someone who's going to fulfill the expectations, the manifest expectations of, of others on you. In order, so to speak, to be dishonest, you don't have to be an inveterate liar. You know, you don't have to, in order to be disrespectful, you don't have to be robustly intrusive in someone's life. One failure is enough to count as doing bad in many of these cases where you've got to be robustly attached um, to the value or to avoiding the disvalue, as in the uh, cruelty case. I just thought I, I liked that uh, argument and I've tried to develop it a little bit elsewhere and its, its significance. Perfect. Thank you. I would also like to thank you for your talk. It was very interesting. Uh, but I would like to hear you a bit more about the question of value conflict. Um, in Bernard Williams, for instance... Value conflict. Value slide. conflict, yeah. yeah. I, yeah. In uh, Bernard Williams, for, uh, for example, uh, it seems that the best case scenario would be in some way a zero-sum game in value conflicts. Uh, in, uh, in a good faith negotiation, for instance, or what we could say in a respectful negotiation in regards to how you define the social value of respect, uh, one would end up having to concede values or to, to sacrifice them in order to uh, gain a common solution to, to a given conflict of values. Uh, in this sense, there's this kind of tragedy of values that we find in, uh, in the Oxford value pluralist that we find also in Max Weber, for instance. But I'm also interested in knowing if we can go further than that. A professor of mine, I don't think he's here, unfortunately, but uh, Professor Charles Bladberg, back at Université de Montréal, has argued, uh, following uh, Hans-Georg Adama, for instance, oh, yeah. that by a mutual reinterpretation of the conflict, a bit like uh, the fusion of horizons in Gadama's uh, aesthetics, um, of the conflict and of the conflicting values, we could go further than the conflict of values and thus escape this uh, zero-sum game uh, situation in a way that there would be no more conflict because we would, would both reinterpret our basic values in such a way that there would be no more issue. And I was wondering, would that be possible, especially given the idea that by personating, we tend to robustly commit to values in time and thus to a certain hierarchy of values that it seems to be fixed I was wondering uh, if this is possible and in which circumstances we could hope to do so. 
Okay, big, big question. So, yeah. I, I do think that values conflict with one another. I didn't talk about that at all today, as Chuck Taylor equally thinks that values can conflict with one another. Um, it's very interesting, the connection, well, I talked today about you know, value on one side, just desire or temptation on the other. But of course, you can find, you know, um, you really want to attend your child's concert, whatever, there's a value in favor of that, but you really should go to the departmental meeting. There's a, a value mm -hmm. in favor of that too. I mean, is each case an attractor on, that would play a role, so to speak, in your avowal as to what you would do? Uh, but they happen to conflict in this c context. And in a case like that, you've just, I think, got to trade off their demands against one another and uh, go one way or the other. That's not a case of failing, though it will cause you regret, that's for sure. You go to the departmental meeting, you're really going to regret not being at your child's concert, you know? Even though you do what you think ultimately is uh, for the best in terms of, of value. Now, um, the other question about whether or not we can, as it were, transcend the conflict of values. Um, it's very interesting, the Gadamer connection. I'd, I hadn't thought of the fusion of horizons as a way of, so to speak, transcending values, but of course the theorists best known nowadays, at least in analytical circles, for arguing that we can transcend values when we interpret them properly is, is Ronnie Dworkin. Um, I have criticized Dworkin's view elsewhere. I mean, let me tell you briefly the mistake I think that Dworkin makes. Uh, I hope I can make this intelligible in a few remarks. Um, he thinks that uh, you start out with what seems like a conflict of values. So for example, um, let's suppose uh, your devotion to your child or you know the, the unhappiness that would cause your child not to be there or whatever, that's certainly a value and so is going to the departmental meeting. But on his view, when you decide about that it's right to, for example, forget the departmental meeting and go to the uh, child's concert or the other way around, he thinks that what you've then discovered is that uh, something about the demands of, for example, professional um, duty in going to departmental meetings, you've discovered that it doesn't really require you to attend when you're child is, so it's not that there are two values now that are, you've just found out what actually it requires. It doesn't include a requirement to miss the child's uh, concert. I think the mistake there is to think of the relationship between values and judgment as similar to the relationship between data and factual judgment. So uh, when we, 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 there's a well-known principle of complete information you know, if I've got incomplete information, I know about somebody, let's suppose that they're, they're English, and I conclude almost certainly going to be of a mannerly type, you know, the English in general are like that. Uh, so that's one piece of evidence that pulls me in one direction. But then I learn that he's an English football supporter, you know. <laughs> well, that pulls me dramatically in the other direction, or at least they used to have a bad name as football supporters. I'm not sure whether it still applies. That puts me in the other direction. When I decide, oh God, you know, let's be careful about this guy. You know, God knows what he'd be like. Um, it's not that I'm feeling still the pull of, you know, I've, I've simply wiped out the evidence he's English by the fact that he's an English football supporter. So the incomplete information that I had in knowing just that he was English, it ceases to have any impact on my judgment as to what is the case or likely to be the case as whether he's likely to be a nice guy to have around, right? Dworkin is suggesting that it's the same with values, that when you decide the right thing to do is to go to the concert, you just wipe out the, you know, the effect of the other uh, factor, of the fact that it's, you're missing the department. I just think that's phenomenologically incorrect, and I think that it, in the various other problems associated with it as well. So I don't actually myself see a way, though I haven't looked into a Gadamerian way of doing it, I don't myself see a way of transcending the conflict of values. I think that's part of human life, that we have to struggle with values uh, in competition with one another in many contexts, not in all that many contexts, but in some for sure. We equally, of course, have, you mentioned the other contexts where I've got to say, we agree that we have to do something together. It has to be done. 
We can only do it together. Well, maybe that in order to do that together, I've equally got to uh, not be moved by a particular value that might have stopped me cooperating with you or whatever it might be. Of course, that's just going to be another form of conflict of value, and I would say in a case like that, the value that you don't actually act on, it doesn't go completely silent, you know? That's why you really regret it when you go to the departmental meeting and miss the child's um, uh, concert. But equally, you probably regret not being there when that crucial decision was made, you know, where your vote really mattered uh, if you go to the concert. And there's no way out of that conflict. You see, if Dworkin was correct, we ought to um, have no regret whatsoever, you know, in going one way rather than the other, as we've no regret in going with complete evidence versus the partial evidence. A good way in which that's marked by philosophers, by the way, just I'll finish with this, is that in the factual case, we're looking at a prima facie reason for you know, why the person is, let's say, going to be a good company. And then there's another prima facie reason, but he's a footballer. But overall, you, know, you wipe out the, at first sight, prima facie, first consideration. In the case of values, philosophers often use the word pro tanto nowadays, and I think that's right. Values don't have a prima facie hold on us, which is wiped out when we decide what we actually are going to do. They've got a pro tanto hold on us, just as such, they've got a hold on us. And they never lose that hold, even when you have to go against them. So I'm afraid value conflict, in my way of thinking, is really ineradicable. Thank you very much. Hi, uh, thank you. I, I will also thank you for the lectures today. It was uh, very interesting. So um, I, my question, I guess, will we'll, uh, we'll also maybe uh, touch on themes we saw um, yesterday uh, about the, re the relationship between um, personhood and uh, personation. Um, my, my, my question, in fact, is, um, is relied, uh, touch upon uh, constitutive values. Um, and what I, what, I, what I want to understand, in fact, is um, so we're, we're bound to uh, value, constitutive values, because they are necessary to, um, uh, to, to performing well uh, personation, if I understand well. So Good. Uh, uh, respect, um, autonomy, freedom, uh, so all those values can, can, can be um, uh, respect in particular. So I'm, I'm going to take the example of respect because it's easier. So we can be, uh, we can, uh, we can not be the object of respect and, and, and social context. I feel we can, we can understand. We, it, it can happen. It, it's I believe it's rare. And, and some, but let's say we take the extreme case um, of someone who has been deprived of any respect from from the beginning of his yes. life through to the uh, as a slave and an animal. Yes. Um, so I guess my, my question is as follows. So if that person has lacked the ability to, um, to develop those, those constitutive values, um, so does that mean that he cannot person at will? And if he cannot person at will, does this mean he is not fully a person or cannot be fully a person? And if this is the case, um, doesn't this open a kind of dangerous door because I, I can say, oh, the, the, this is not really a person, and therefore um, the, the normative claims we usually that re usually rest upon personhood are therefore weakened because I mean it's not a person, therefore Good. my duties are, are weaker towards them, or some, something. Yeah. That really relates to a question that came up yesterday about animals mm -hmm. and about people who yeah. are you know severely disabled. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. not disabled physically, but. Uh, who are children, for example, babies, or the, mm -hmm. those who are decidedly not able-minded. Mm -hmm. um, there are all sorts of bases for you know, normative claims that other beings have on us. And you know, animals have a claim on us in virtue of the fact they can suffer, well, at least in virtue of the fact that they can suffer pain or pleasure. And of course, similar considerations and much richer ones apply to um, well, would apply to the human being you're imagining, who actually has been so deprived socially, so to speak, so abused socially, as never to have been able to come to fruition, let's put it as a person, to perform properly as a person, uh, to the point where, 
Well, you really are imagining a case where, uh, and unfortunately, as we know, there are some documented cases like this of abandonment to the point where the child, as it often is, or the adult grown from a child so neglected, is really not a properly functioning person at all. But that's still, that individual is still going to have moral, even if they're completely beyond the bounds of personhood, which is a very extreme case and may not even be realizable, even if they were completely beyond the bounds of personhood, uh, they're still going to have a moral claim on you as another human being, and a particular human being with all sorts of sensitivities and cares and capability for pain and pleasure of a whole variety of kinds. Uh, if I can just take you, does that mean there's, are, are, because you say, you, uh, is personal there, therefore on off property, or is there some kind of degrees? Good, uh, okay. Yeah. Well, the, the, the trouble is often we have to do it in an on off way for the sake of clarity. And it all gets very messy once you introduce degrees. But as I said yesterday, the concept of a person, you know, of the kind that I've been talking about, it's built into the concept that there are going to be degrees of performance, degrees of the capacity to personate. Um, and that leaves you with a sort of um, a degree of freedom, as it were, of theoretical freedom, in determining if there is a threshold and where that threshold lies, such that beyond the threshold, you know, you say, well, this isn't really a person, above the threshold it is. Um, I'm not sure that introducing a threshold would serve any purpose, uh, but it's certainly a, an available conceptual move. Thank you. Um, I had pretty much exactly the same question, but with regards to sociopathy. Right, okay. Um, so I, I Acquired has, sociopathy. Yeah, it has more to do with association than it does with the threshold question. Um, but in the sense that your associations are essentially meaningless uh, if you don't uh, personally associate with them. Well, we're talking about a condition that varies in severity, right? right. Um, I mean... So sociopathy might be, you know, the Silas, what's the name, Silas? The, oh, the, the case of the patient in the 19th century of the crowbar. Hmm? Phineas, is it Phineas Gage? Yeah, okay. Uh, the Phineas Gage case, I mean, where he had a personality disorder, really, but it's often described as the paradigm of acquired soci sociopathy, where, you know, he, it's true that he he couldn't be relied upon, and he would say one thing, but it would bear little or no relationship to what he did. So that is a very good case, I agree, of a sort of breakdown of personation. Um, I'm not sure what I have to say about it, other than to say it, it, it is, you can characterize it in the terminology I've been using, describing it as a breakdown of personation, and therefore a failure, so to speak, of personhood, I mean, it's not a complete failure because presumably in some respects he is reliable or can be reliable across some time intervals or reliable in certain contexts. But it's certainly a sort of incapacity, an incapacitation that is going to, if not wholly undermine person, it certainly reduce it. Now, that is back to the threshold question. Um, I'm sort of loath to say not a person at all happier to say something like not a properly functioning person, you know, um, not a person who lives up to the ideal that is actually endemic in the notion of personhood, uh, rather than saying not a person at all. But I think what the, the relationship possible with such an individual, right, is the relationships possible are going to be severely limited by the fact of that um, sociopathy. And... Um, and really all the language I'm using does is enable you to describe that condition. Um, it doesn't remove the, um, the normative basis, consistent in this being a human being who would suffer for treating the person properly. It does, however, uh, raise question marks about how far, you know, duties due to a person alone you know, like fidelity to what you promised them or, you know, taking them at their word, relying on them when they promise you to do something, it certainly becomes a clear how far they retain a grip when you realize this is not a proper, properly functioning person. 
Hi. Uh, thank Hello. you for the talk. Uh, you mentioned in your lecture yesterday that uh, corporate persons fit within your definition of personhood. So when yep. a group of people come together and designate a representative, yep. that's a type of personhood. And I was wondering to what extent uh, an artificial or corporate person then has values, and if like values of autonomy and respect are as central to them, or if this is how you kind of differentiate the two. Good. No, it, that's, it's a very big question, but it's a very important question. Um, so I think that insofar as a group of people can constitute themselves as a reliable agent, establishing a spokesperson or a network of spokespersons, in any case a voice, which communicates to others what you can expect of them en masse as a group as to how they will behave, a voice that can make commitments to individuals but also to other corporate persons. Uh, to the extent to which you achieve that sort of incorporated personhood, um, you're going to, for example, um, the, all sorts of possibilities um, arise. So one is, you're going to have to give, if corporate persons of that kind are going to operate in our society, they have to be given some rights. Mm. If in any case, it has to be clear what they can commit to doing or not doing, whether or not they've got discretion or a choice in a certain area. And of course, our history of law um, makes clear that we have varied fantastically in the range of rights we've actually given corporate bodies. So for example, in the in the, um, up to really the late, mid 18th century, 19th century. Um, I think it's fair to say no commercial corporation was allowed just change business, you know, become a bank having been a textile firm or whatever. But they were given that right uh, from about 1840 in Britain and I suspect in Canada, um, necessarily come to think of it, 1840s before, um, you don't call it independence. What happened in 1867? Federation, yes. <laughs> okay. um, so it's clear that while you have to give corporate persons certain rights, or else they won't be able to act at all, the rights you give them may, uh, may vary a great deal. And a big question that arises is, what rights should they have? Now, um, I have an argument that goes roughly as follows. Whenever you give rights to a corporate body of any kind, it could be a corporation, a commercial corporation, it could be a university, it could be a political party, it could be a church, uh, it could be a voluntary organization, an NGO, a school, or whatever. Whenever you give a right to rights of any kind to a corporate body of that kind, you give rights at the same time to the individuals who run it. So for example, um, if you allow the corporation, you know, change its mode of business like that. Well, you're AO ipso, you're allowing the individuals within the corporation benefit from that sort of shift, for example. And that means that any corporate right that you introduce or recognize, you have to recognize it's a right given to individuals. Mm -hmm. And with any right given to individuals, you have to ask, how does it fit with the right that we give to other individuals, other individual human beings? And of course, we don't give some rights um, because they're not consistent with the rights of others. And the whole idea of a regime of rights is to have a compossible, as it's often called, regime of rights such that everyone can exercise their rights and they're relatively, uh, they have rights as equals. They'll differ in various ways. Men may have different rights or women have different rights from men in various areas. Well, that's not a good example, but you know, in different, for example, officers of, of the law can have rights that others don't have and so on. But it still has to be relatively equal. But if, if rights given to corporations are always rights given to individuals, and if the rights given to individuals have to become possible in that sense, then we should only give such rights to corporations as satisfy that compossibility condition at the level of individuals. And I would argue that argues for a severe restriction on the rights given to corporate persons, corporate bodies, besides natural persons or individuals. So you see how the argument goes. So to argue that corporate persons should have certain rights is not to say they should have the same rights mm -hmm. as natural persons. That's a mistake, I think, made by um, 
people on the other side say, oh, you can't recognize corporate persons because they're then going to have to have the same rights. It doesn't follow at all. What does follow, though, if they're corporate persons capable of agency, is that they can be held responsible in their own right, as it were, for what they do. But that's, I don't want to, I could go on f too long on this topic, so maybe I'll just stop that. Thank you. I want to add another dimension to our discussion of the conflict between values. So you've, you've discussed two cases. One is the intra-individual case. Uh, so for instance, I go to the departmental meeting, but I'll still regret not having gone to, to my uh, daughter's concert. And another one is the inter-individual case, where uh, yeah. we might have to com make compromises between your values and my values. Yes. And in both cases, you argued against, against working in that, that the attraction of the other value doesn't go away. It, it stays with us. Right? Yeah. So here's a third one, and that's the intra-individual conflict of values over time. Right? So uh, over time, my values change. Uh, and in this case, at least it might be the case that the attraction of the other one goes away. I really have a complete change of my sure. Weltanschauung over Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Right? And this seems a particularly interesting one for your theory to explain because you yeah. told us that values have the, are, are this robust ground yes. for us to, yes. to personate towards others in society. Uh, and therefore, it's particularly important to have a, a way of explaining how uh, this robust ground kind of moves and changes over time. So I wanted to invite you to say something about, about change of values over time. Good, and equally it applies, of course, to change of beliefs. Um, and we know that, uh, I mean, we all accept one another that we can say, look, I know that I believe that, but actually I should tell you, I no longer, I disavow that belief. That's no longer a, a belief I stand by. Um, Similarly, you might say, well, I really did think that the prime value was candor with other people, but you know, I've really changed my mind because I can see it can be very destructive of relationships to be too candid, you know, some of the time. I mean, these are changes that we recognize all the time. Now, in order to be a person at any one time, you've got to, so speak, think you can speak for yourself, and in order to think you can speak for yourself, you've got to be able to identify things, desiderata, properties, that are values for you, that you robustly, you invite others robustly to rely on you. But that's quite consistent, but I should mention this, and thank you for giving me the opportunity, that's quite consistent uh, with allowing that there may, be, there may come, you know, divisions in time, breaks, ruptures, you know, in any person's life. And at that point, the person is, I think, obliged in a way with those who are involved to explain that they have changed their mind about those values so that other people aren't misled you know, in relying on them when actually they no longer stand with that value, so to speak. I'm reminded of uh, a wonderful exchange that uh, philosopher Jenny Lloyd described to me once when she met her old tutor in Oxford, Elizabeth Anscombe. These are names I'm sure all of you will know, certainly Elizabeth Anscombe's. And uh, Elizabeth, who was of course a very fervent Catholic, um, invited Ginny, who indeed was raised a Catholic, um, to a little conference of basically Catholic philosophers. And Ginny said to her, well, Elizabeth, I think I should tell you that that I've lost my faith, you know? Now this is disavowing, you know? To which she says, she responds, Jenny assures me with the monocle in place, you've lost your faith, <laughs> you know? The Lady Bracknell style. I mean, obviously we disavow uh, things we previously avowed at various points as she was disavowing the religious belief that otherwise Elizabeth would have relied on her having. That story is of no import other than I thought, I, I thought, it, might, I thought it, might, it might entertain slightly. You know, I was thinking of the Lady Bracknell, of course, and the importance of being honest, you know. Mr. Worthing, you know, to have lost one person, maybe described as a tragedy, to have lost two sounds like carelessness, you know. So thank you again, uh, another fascinating talk. Um, I, 
It's maybe a clarification question, I'm not sure. I, I was, um, you know, when you started explaining what desiderata are, I, I wondered whether it was more in terms of the prediction of the kind of desires you would have, sort of, in the future, I'm going to be attracted by this thing uh, robustly, or the, whether you were trying to describe what other people want to express in terms of what makes a desire or an attitude fitting or apt, or appropriate, uh, in something that's more compatible with a realist framework. And so I'd like to see more where you stand in terms of this debate. Uh, you sounded very constructivist today. And that's a bit of a worry, if I can add uh, something, because I'm not sure you need more than desires to function as person and to personate. I'm trying to learn that language. <laughs> <laughs> um, because, you know, you could do... Um, the things like avoil and pledges, just with desires, it seems. It's not obvious to me that you need uh, uh, more than uh, uh, desires, so values. Well, well, I mean, this is just a small comment. I mean, one sense which I readily agree with that is desire is meant as a sort of catch holder here for a whole range of, of effective responses that we might have. But going back to the main point, See, I think that the real puzzle in explaining how we come to be uh, evaluative creatures, not just desiderative creatures, uh, is to explain where the aptness comes from, you know? know? So as desiderative creatures, you know, various things prompt our desires, you know? They're, in that sense, sorry, fitness comes from, not aptness. They're apt to prompt our desire. I mean, that just they're disposed to prompt our desires. But we think with those attractors, which is values, that those are the ones it's fit to answer to. You know, those are the ones it's correct in some way. Those are the ones that would be a failure not to be moved by. And the question is, how does a creature like us, the product of natural revolution, but equally the cultural evolution involved, as I see it, in being a linguistic creature, a personating creature, and so on, where does the criterion of fitness come from, you know, that introduces the, the thin end of the value wedge, you know, the idea that some attractors are not just apt uh, to attract you, but fit uh, to be found attractive. And I say that, well, one explanation of why some attractors have that feature is, if you are someone who is in the business of committing yourself to others as being a person on this story involves, then it's going to be the case that you have to, willy-nilly, you have to, so to speak, treat some attractors as ones that um, you take to be robustly attractive enough for you to pledge the actions you're prompted by their being regarded as supports or to avow the desires for the bearers of those sorts of properties. Willy nilly, you have to treat some attractors in that way and treat other factors, albeit they may be contingently attractive, as not having that feature. And of course, people may differ in what attractors count in that way for them as fit to be acted on as well as apt to be acted on. And what I like is that the personation story, the commitment story, that it gives you a criterion for a fitness, because it tells you those attractors will count as values, will be fit to be acted upon, insofar as those are the attractors that provide you with, so to speak, the base of your self-personation. So that's, that's, why, that's where I think the fitness comes from. And I mean, now, no doubt there may be other sources, or other pressures towards moving into the space of values, I particularly like this because it's evolutionarily intelligible and um, I mean I should say I've just published this book called The Birth of Ethics which tries to support precisely this sort of, uh, this sort, sort of view. Thank you. Thank you so much for the, uh, for the great talk. Uh, according to, to your system of uh, values, uh, I think freedom, uh, as you mentioned, is the one that provides the infrastructure so that the other uh, constitutive values can flourish. But then my, my question turns to the situation that there is no political freedom, which is mostly the case. 
And then uh, the persons want to revolt or want to resist to gain such, I mean, values. And then my, my question is, what is the constitutive value of a person in the mode of resistance? So do we have a value that can constitute a person while resisting or revolting? Well, what I said about political freedom is that at the level of politics, this understanding of personhood, this understanding of respect, um, leads you to see why freedom in my sense, freedom is not domination, should be a political value. Okay, now, but I agree with you entirely, of course. Uh, many of us live in polities, uh, countries, states, where there isn't political freedom or a heavily restricted range of political freedom. And, um, I mean, in such a case, you, you can still be a person because you've still got the coteries of respect, you know, um, in which you, um, you operate relative to others. And I don't see any problem but why, as persons valuing freedom, seeing why it's important, recognizing it's not delivered, uh, being courageous enough and concerned with others enough, um, I don't see why there's any inconsistency in leading resistance against the, that regime. Uh, you know, fighting for change extra-constitutionally, presumably, that would introduce a greater degree of vertical and, and horizontal freedom, as I was describing it. So I think that it fits okay. I don't think there's any, any tension there. So uh, my, my question is related to this previous one, but I think still um, quite different. So first, um, just to check, is it right to say that uh, there, can, there can be someone uh, so constricted and so oppressed and so dominated that they, they fall below the threshold of being a person, right? So we can imagine again, to go back to the slave situation, imagine there's still a little enclave somewhere where there's just one slave, right? And then, yes. and then just a bunch of masters Good. and this one slave. Uh, so this person doesn't even have anyone else um, with whom they can personate properly, certainly not to, to the degree required for them, let's assume. I mean, let's assume that that's possible. Or rather, I wanted to ask you if that is possible, right? That's conceivable. Um, it's a horror scenario, isn't it? I, yeah. I don't know really how to get my mind around it, but I, I, what I'm inclined to say is that um, if someone really grew up in a situation where they're likely to be, I mean, that presumably is true of their childhood and so on, I mean, yeah. as in yeah. toddlers, etc. They've always lived in a world where no one has taught them that they can speak for themselves and that others will rely on what they say and will relate to them on that basis and will, you know, stick with that mode of relationship robustly, you know, not abandoning or abusing it. Well, that is totally absent. Um, and they grow into a world where they literally are everyone's slave, you know, with absolutely no never given a hearing, so to speak, because the words are of no interest, treated as... I mean, I just don't have the capacity to, you know, work out reliably what it would be like for such an individual. Right, but, the but I think, I suspect it, it, you're really going to take the person to the very limit of what we would call, you know, normal performance of a human being. But the claim, I, I, I take it that it doesn't have, the claim doesn't have to be as strong as they never ever I see. once personated, but right. somehow they fall below the threshold because they have been severely oppressed. Right? But assuming such a situation is possible and that such a person would fall below the threshold of personhood, here's the question, <laughs> the real question. Um, there seem, it seems to be a problematic implication then um, of your view that this being would not have the rights corresponding to a person, which I assume, for example, would uh, involve you know, po political rights, um, very strong political rights that we don't normally give to uh, animals, who I assume are, are not persons, though they have the rights associated with just being sentient beings and so on. 
but this person also wouldn't be given like the rights, as, and you didn't say exactly what those are, the rights associated with personhood specifically, but clearly such a person would be given them, and that seems problematic because it seems to be that th that's precisely the person who needs those rights, right? the political rights, and whatever else comes with the rights of personhood. Well, I mean, on the story I'm thinking of, you know, um, the, the right to respect, if you might call it that, is really even more basic. Um, and I would hope that even in slave societies, the slave class would find people with whom they relate as persons and learn what it is to be a person and learn why it is that the relationship with the masters is so resentable and evil. Uh, you're imagining the individual who doesn't have other slaves, so it is still a sort of horror scenario, but maybe is sometimes treated quite well, you know, but most of the time it's volatility all around, you know. Um, I mean, I, I first of all don't want to put in a threshold, as I said earlier, you know, I'm not sure that it ser would serve much purpose. Um, now, how exactly you'd characterize their state of being, their state of mind, you know, I honestly don't know. But when you say that person ought to be given political rights and political freedom, of course that's, that's the case. Um, one would hope that they don't come too late, so to speak. You can imagine someone who's raised to adulthood without having even rights of respect, no sort of relationship at all, relationships in which they enjoy respect. It might be that while you think they should have those rights, as in they would then, had they at least had those rights, they would prosper as a person, and equally the right of freedom, I mean, that, that secures it, so to speak, um, the, all of that can be true, but it might actually come too late, you know, in the sense that the person might never be capable of being brought back to what we think of as the normal uh, standing of a person. But they'd still be an object, a subject of care, you know, f for all sorts of reasons. And of course their performance might, while being not that of a full functioning person, might still be that of a very possibly loving, you know, engaged human being. Um, I wouldn't for a moment want to say that those who are less than fully functioning persons are not, so to speak, appropriate objects of love or affection or care and so on. Final question. Final question. <clears throat> yes, um, well, thank you for your talk. Um, so my question is about the relationship between the social value of respect and the political value, uh, political value of freedom. Good. So uh, when you when you mention uh, when you mentioned the social value of respect, it reminded me of a uh, Tocqueville, um, and Tocqueville, I think, in Democracy in America, he sort of like criticized Americans for uh, keeping this uh, this um, relationship of, of respect uh, within the inner circle um, that actually prevents them from engaging in the public affairs. Um, so they, they, they like Americans, they only engage in public affairs instrumentally, and then once they uh, finish their public uh, job together, they go back to their inner circle and have their um, relationship, relationship of respect. So I wonder whether like, you see the social value of respect nat naturally expands to the political value of freedom, or do you see any like, a tension? Is there like, a tension between those, those two? Well, I, I'll tell you very briefly what I think of as the relationship. I think that, um, first of all, something I haven't said that you give me the chance to say. I actually think that um, without any law, we might do pretty well at respecting one another. But if you imagine that there are differences of power or influence or money or whatever amongst us, um, we might each still be disposed to behave respectfully towards others. But it's going to be the case that with some individuals, it's like the master and the slave. Though it's very nice that the master is disposed to show respect, to treat me with respect. And it's sort of dependent on his continuing goodwill. So there's still going to be a reason for me to care about keeping him sweet. And that's going to warp, so to speak, the aggressive and pro-aggressive relationships that are, as I was saying, the infrastructure of respect. Now, that to me suggests 
that a world in which people were all well disposed in that way, respectfully well disposed towards one another, but where there were inequalities of, of wealth or power or whatever, that that world would be deeply improved by having a structure of law that actually meant that you didn't depend on just the goodwill of the wealthy to treat you with respect because it was manifest that they were exposed to the rigors of the law if they didn't treat you in that way. So I actually think that having a law that secures, so to speak, respect enhances the value of respect itself. That's, that's one thing I want to say. But the other is that you could have a society where people are free, but where they're not all that personally respectful. In logic, you would have. There's a possible, remote possible world out there, you know, where creatures are, the law is so effective that people treat one another as if they have respect, let's call that with respect. But actually, they, they, they'd all love to not do that, you know, they'd love to duck the law and actually push other people around. As a matter of logic, it's possible that you have freedom as non-domination in that world without respect. Mm -hmm. um, so in that sense, they're, they come apart. Hopefully, I think it's true as a matter of fact, that when you have law, it doesn't just constrain people, it actually educates people, it gives them a value, and people tend to I identify and internalize a law, you know, that they see as relatively fair, so it can actually elicit the very dispositions of respect that it would enrich uh, the freedom case. So putting that in other words, I think freedom is essential, at least small groups, you know, for any respect, but across a society for secure respect. And I mean by freedom, I mean legally secured freedom, legally protected uh, legal rights and, and so on and empowerment, that's necessary for a regime of proper respect and personhood. That's what I believe myself. But it's not strictly sufficient. Uh, you could have that sort of freedom, that sort of law, amongst a race, so to speak, of people who would otherwise treat one another very badly. It's at least logically possible. But I think they do go together. It's a necessary condition of respect across the society, that it be, be a free society, uh, I think it's also empirically, contingently sufficient in the sense that when you have a law like that, I think it tends to elicit the best in people, so to speak, rather than their remaining, you know, um, devils, so to speak, who would have a go at one another if they could only duck the law. Okay. Thank you. Um, Last night, after uh, Professor Pettit's uh, first lecture, I had the impression that uh, I was being led during the lecture from one chamber to another in a very orderly tour as we toured one wing of a palace of, I guess, Professor Pettit's mind. <laughs> and I think that we've now uh, had a tour of the second, uh, second wing of this palace. And I'd like to ask you to join me in thanking uh, Professor Pettit for this wonderful lecture.